Welcome to another trip down the Bourbon Road with your hosts, Jim and Mike. So grab a glass of your favorite bourbon and kick back. Hello, everybody. I'm Jim Shannon. And I'm Mike Hyatt. And this is the Bourbon Road. And today, Mike, you and I are going to sit down for a few minutes and talk about a little road trip you just had. Yeah, I uh, just got back from, I don't know, West Virginia and Pittsburgh area. Uh, But I went up and I visited uh, Wiggle Whiskey in downtown Pittsburgh. Kind of a little stomping ground for my regular work right there on the Allegheny River. The confluence is right there of the Ohio with the Bongahela running into it. So it was a pretty neat visit for me in talk about some whiskey history jim they got it up there yeah yeah i imagine so because i mean that was a big steel town well it was a big steel town it still is really a big steel town it's in the rust belt right that's why they call this the rust belt that's kind of the start of it but when i talk about whiskey history i'm talking about before that i'm talking about george washington the whiskey rebellion you know Phil Weigel, which today they say Wiggle, he was a started a little thing called the Whiskey Rebellion up there. George Washington, um, he was commissioned to go up there and stop it, which is pretty cool to think about that whiskey history up there and on the lineage that they have in American whiskey, really. But did it start in Pittsburgh area? Maybe. And would there be bourbon without the Ohio River with people coming down? Because that's how they got down to Kentucky, right? It was down the Ohio River. Um, they didn't cover the mountains the first time they came down that river. Um, so to me, it was kind of special going up there and visiting them. Um, I brought you a couple bottles back. You're sipping on a little bit. Yeah, I'm sipping on a little bit of their Pennsylvania straight bourbon whiskey. And uh, you also brought me a bottle of their uh, their port cask finished rye. So I'm kind of looking forward to trying that one. I haven't tried it yet. You were saying that the uh, bourbon tasted like pears a little bit or snows like pears. And that's pretty great observation. But what a great trip. I, You know, I missed getting to go to the distillery with you because that excitement of going to a a young distillery like this. Now, they've been operating for quite a while now, a little over 10 years almost. And uh, they've got 85 different expressions, Jim. They got some stuff going on up there. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot to keep track of. My goodness. Yeah, most of it is experimental stuff that they have going on, um, and it's stuff that's only released at the distillery or in that local little region there. But they had stuff like rhubarb whiskey. I've never seen rhubarb whiskey before, have you? No, but that I love rhubarb pie, so that I would definitely like to try it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what Vivian said, too. When she was looking at it, she was like, I love rhubarb pie. Maybe I love rhubarb whiskey. But they had all, uh, something for everybody up there, and I think that's what they're doing is trying to get people to step outside the box, introduce more people to whiskey, maybe those people that are right on the fringe like me and you always talk about. That was pretty neat. Um, great little distillery in downtown. Um I mean, it's stone's throw from the river. So, and it's in an old brewery district, old distillery district, uh, in their bathrooms and on the walls, there's these old blueprints of the city. And I don't think they're called blueprints. I don't know what exactly what they would be called. Uh, City maps, right? City maps, but it was the drawing of it. And it's where the bonded warehouses were in the city. Ah. And uh, today it's more of flour companies and uh, noodle companies and stuff like that in that area in those old warehouses. Uh, Wiggle actually sets in the old brewery of the Phoenix Brewing Company uh, right there. And I didn't know there was a Phoenix Brewing Company. I do know about Iron City Beer uh, from Pittsburgh. I'm sure you've heard of that in your life. I have heard of that, yeah. Um, But just a cool cool experience. It was a six and a half hour drive up there. We got up there about two o'clock. They were nice enough to take us around. Michael, um, their director of uh, operations was up there. He gave us a uh, tour of their facility, sat down with us. We talked for a good hour about the distillery, what they got going on. I was kind of excited to see it. The only harsh thing I could say about them um, was their bottle. They used that stag junior bottle and their new bottle they have they're having a hard time with glass like everybody else you know 
Um, that is a, just a part of life that distilleries are living with right now. And I'd like to remind listeners, hey, be patient with your distilleries. It's not that they're changing bottles or labels. And we've talked about this on a previous episode. Um, they're just going through pains like everybody else was with shipping, right? And they're doing what they can to get their 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 liquid in a bottle and get it to you. But uh, times are tough for everybody right now. I mean, even beer beer companies are having trouble getting bottles, so they're shipping cans mostly, right? It's just a tough time for glass. Well, heck, I didn't even know about that about beer bottles. That's an interesting fact right there. I didn't think about it. There is a lot of canned beer on the shelves right now. There is. There absolutely is. Well, I kind of envy you, Mike, going to Pittsburgh. I, I kind of want to get back up there again someday. It's been... It's been a minute since I was in Pittsburgh. My family actually uh, immigrated through Pittsburgh back in the 1870s. And uh, my great-great-grandfather worked in a steel mill there. So a little bit of Shannon history in Pittsburgh. I'm sure he was drinking just a little bit of whiskey, too, being an Irishman. (laughs) Well, did he eat at Permani Brothers? I don't have a lot of history on him. He, He died right around 1902. So uh don't really know a whole lot about him, but uh he was the the one that crossed the crossed the sea and came here first. So Wow. Well that's some great knowledge right there. Me and Vivian went to Permani Brothers. If you haven't been to Pittsburgh, go to Wiggle Whiskey, pick up yourself some uh of their bourbon or some of their whiskeys, then walk right down the street. I mean it's like three blocks away is Permani Brothers. That is the famous sandwich shop where they put coleslaw french fries and then some sandwich meat on uh, two slices of bread uh, i had to go there to get one i had never had any uh, sandwich from there so i wanted to try it and that was kind of the highlight of our weekend um, then we drove down to morgantown west virginia i was watching my texas longhorns play west virginia mountaineers they they lost um i got to give it to the fans there mountaineer fans Jim were spectacular, very kind, uh, very generous. Um, I not what I expected. I got to say my hats off to them. The way they treated uh, Longhorns fans there, there were plenty of Longhorns fans there, and they did nothing but respect when we were walking out. Say people were fist bumping us and say, "Hey, thanks for coming. Have a safe trip home." Um, people offered us beer. They offered us whiskey there. And I actually walked around and gave out some whiskey and some cards. So we probably got some new listeners from that from that uh, time there you know me um never met a stranger that's right same goes for my trip to a mountaineer stadium there um what a great time we still had a great time even though they lost uh i always look at the best in life and what i took away from that was the people west virginia truly love their football they love their team they don't have a pro sports team there so that's the team they embrace um my hat's off to you mountaineers fans Um, i wish you the best of luck in the rest of your season um, I definitely enjoyed my time there, even though my team lost. Um, that's a true fan for you, though, right? You're, you got to stick with them through the ups and downs. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You got to you got to keep saying hook them horns, right? Yeah. Anytime you can, you got to say hook them horns. And sometimes you got to eat a little crow. Um, I did say that in a video on TikTok and on Instagram that my long horns are going to whoop that ass. And uh, I had to eat a little crow. But I, you know, I drove back to Kentucky with my head held high. Um, I still got to see my team. I got to spend some couple good quality days with my wife on the road. Uh, We always enjoy our road trips together. And I I got to drink some good whiskey from a craft distillery up there in Pittsburgh. Um, Listeners, if you get a chance, like I said, get out there, get on the road, visit those craft distilleries in your town in if you're in the airport or you got a couple hours, put it in your phone. See how far it is. It is worth the visit. Well, absolutely, Mike. Well, I'm kind of anxious to hear how your interview went uh, at Wiggle. And uh, I think our listeners are probably waiting for that, too. So I, I don't think we should delay any longer. Let's let's get to the episode. What do you say? Let's do it. All right. Hey listeners, this is Big Chief from the Bourbon Road Podcast, and uh, once again, I'm on the road. I got on the road with my wife, came up to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania today. Nice, beautiful drive through the mountains of West Virginia, 
crossed over the Mongahela River a couple times, um, crossed back over the Allegheny, uh, right at the confluence of the Ohio River. What they call three rivers right there, downtown Pittsburgh. Beautiful place. And uh, lo and behold, I found myself a distillery here in Pittsburgh. It is Wiggle Whiskey. Um, and I'm super excited. This is one of the distilleries I wanted to visit. I'm sitting down with Michael Fogel, their director of production here. He is the the man, the myth, the legend. I think this is what they call him here. He's the the man that does everything around here. Uh, he's got his hands in everything. Is that is that true, Mike? That is uh that's reasonably true. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> well, you it's it's a whole bunch of hats, right? We are we're a, a small family owned company, so uh, everybody in the company wears a, a whole lot of hats. But a uh, team concept, team concept. But yep, I'm the director of production, and uh, I've been working here for about six years. Six years. Mm-hmm. So you went from front of the house, from the the pretty face. Oh yeah. To to working, getting them hands dirty. Yeah, my path. Um, I started out working in the tasting room. Uh, doing guided flights, uh, pouring cocktails, uh, selling retail bottles. Um, and at the same time I was working on my, uh, master's degree, I was getting a master's in food studies in Pittsburgh. And part of that, uh, experience was doing an internship for product development. And so I started, uh, working in product development for cider as well as for spirits and, um, created a whole bunch of new liqueurs, uh, spirits, whiskeys, was doing product development for about three, four years and have switched into a more general, uh, leadership role in production in the past, uh, year and a half to two years. Really? That's a pretty awesome background and a kind of bringing yourself up through a whiskey making, right? Um, you're St. Louis guy. Grew up in St. Louis. Yep. And, uh, I've lived in Texas, North Carolina, uh, Spain, and I've been in Pittsburgh for, uh, about seven years now. About seven years. Well, it was a lovely drive up here. I actually got on the phone with one of our sponsors, seldom seen farms, trying to figure out, um, who he's working with and what's going on. It's that time of the year, right? The holidays, people need to buy this guy's maple syrup. It's aged in bourbon barrels. You want to check this guy out, check his website out, buy some of his product, send it out to your family. It's seldom seen maple.com. He really does age his maple syrup out of those 2000 trees in some bourbon barrels. You can see it at a couple of distilleries out there. One of our friends is fixing to have it on the shelf at Leaper's Fork Distillery in Tennessee. Make sure you check them out. Let's get into the history of, of Wiggle Whiskey and let's drink some of this first whiskey you set out for us. What do you got for us? Okay. Uh, so the first whiskey is uh, our Pennsylvania straight bourbon. This is our most widely distributed product. Uh, to most people who might recognize the name uh, Wiggle, this is uh, potentially the the bottle that comes to mind first. It's a uh, really bright yellow label. And this is, again, our most uh, widely sold distributed uh, whiskey. This is a blended bourbon. So uh, we're using 53-gallon barrels and 25-gallon barrels. Um, minimum of two years old. For most of our batches these days, we will tend to be using 53 gallon barrels that have been aged for at least four years and uh, a number of 25 gallon barrels that uh, would have been somewhere between two and three years. So, you know, this is definitely a, an interesting uh, brand. In with respect to uh, consistency and blending this flavor uh, every single time using different sized barrels, different lots of corn. Um, but this is really our most popular, widely distributed uh, product. What's the mash bill on this? My percentages might be off, but uh, I could tell you about 1,000. 
80 pounds of corn, 414 pounds of malt, and I believe 390, 370 of wheat. So when you say malt, you're talking about malted barley. Organic malted barley, correct. All right. And I did know on here, it says USDA organic. Is all your guys' whiskey organic? Not all of it's organic. Um, the organic process is, is really restrictive. Uh, almost all of our whiskey, I'd say uh, 94% of our whiskey is distilled from organic grain. But if we go into a finishing barrel, uh, we'll lose the organic status. If we um, add certain botanicals or sugar to it to make a liqueur, we'll lose the organic status. So really? All of the grain that we're bringing in, um, aside from, um, on occasion, smoked malted barley, which we use to make our smoked bourbon, all of that is always going to be organic, but it might not have the organic label on the finished product because um, in the case of, say, cinnamon whiskey, that's going to be an organic mash bill. That's about 65% organic wheat. 35% Thirty-five percent uh, organic malted barley. We're going to add on um, organic cinnamon or potentially uh, conventional cinnamon. And once we add the sugar, it's a conventional product. If we take uh, you know this bourbon and put it into a Madeira barrel, um, like the bottle you'll go home with, once it hits the Madeira barrel, conventional product. So uh, we do support organic farms and all of our grain uh, that's bought from the local farms, that's always organic. It may not reach the bottle with an organic designation though. Really? That's super fascinating to me, uh, the organic part of it. Well, let's taste this. And I think the organic part for us, you know, it's a really organic designation can be a really, uh, really tricky thing to talk about. Uh, it's expensive. A lot of farmers, uh, will tell you that it, it costs too much to, to have that designation. And, uh, certainly, you know, we know farms that have certified naturally grown or other designations, uh, for fresh fruit, we'll use conventional. Our whole thing is we want to be working with partners who are stewards of, of their land and are approaching, uh, farming and, uh, and, agriculture from a sustainable, we want to keep this thing running perspective. So on the nose on this, I get a bunch of honey for some reason. Um, and maybe it is that malted barley that there's so much in here. A little bit of marshmallow, maybe toasted marshmallow. I always get a lot of, uh, like toffee and, um, honey. I get a little bit of a, a fruitiness. Um, like that little cherry hint, um, which is funny because, you know, cherry and, and banana are two flavors that come up a lot in, in beer and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately I, I personally don't care for either of them. Um, <laughs> I actually also get in this right here, um, a little bit of Maybe burnt citrus, like you would take in, uh, not burn an orange peel, but you know, sear it. You get a little bit of that. Yeah. I think, I think like a, a roasted orange peel. Yeah. Roasted kinda, orange peel. Kind of flambe kind of thing. Well, cheers. Let me taste this thing. And so this is of the core of the corns that we use. This is a just, organic yellow dent corn. We do work with another variety of corn, but for our base whiskeys, it's a, it's an organic, uh, yellow dent corn. Well, it's got everything there for me. Now you guys are doing sweet mash here, so it doesn't have, I would call it that Pennsylvania hug. Like I would expect, (laughs) um, but still really beautiful. All the nose is there in the, taste too in the palate it's everything that i explained there in the nose is right there a little bit light on the palate Mm -hmm. leaving that kind of medium finish but that that little bit of burn is there a little bit of spice a little bit of pop rocks as me and jim always say it's there. very beautiful bourbon i I like it it's different 
I'm pleased to hear that. It's it is representative of where we are in the state and what's growing here. Uh, we certainly play a a big role in developing the flavors and developing the product, but uh, all of this stuff is is terroir driven, and you know it's going to be a reflection of uh, what's around us the the seasons, the soil, all that stuff. Let's talk about the history because okay. some of our listeners they really do like the history. Um, tell me the history of Wiggle Whiskey. So Wiggle Whiskey, um, we're about 10 years old. We opened up in, I believe, 2012. And this is a a family-owned, family-operated business. So uh, the first two, three years, uh, every employee was a family member. Um, and it was inspired when the family took a trip up to the Finger Lakes. And they saw you know, the craft alcohol uh, revolution, that movement, and then how important that was and how neat that was. They were also really familiar with this idea that Pittsburgh has a huge, critical legacy in the American whiskey story. And that since Prohibition, that legacy had not necessarily... um, been active or been showcased. So it was a family that was uh, looking for a family business, had uh, encountered the, um, all of the positive qualities of, you know, a trip to the Finger Lakes and saw an opportunity that uh, was missing from the landscape. And so uh, they started in 2012, uh, got equipment, started uh, finding farmers. And for the first couple of years, they were distilling uh, white wheat whiskey and white rye. And they will tell you the first couple of years uh, thought, we're never going to do bourbon. The history of this region is uh, rye. The Whiskey Rebellion was all about rye. Monongahela rye is the story. And, you know, over the course of uh, last 10 years, we've expanded from white rye and white wheat to a um, really big catalog of aged whiskeys. And we've started making liqueurs and brandies. Um, practically any category of spirits you can imagine, um, we've tried at least one one-off expression of, yeah, 10 years, starting out the way that I think a lot of our peers do with the unaged spirits and then slowly introducing more products and Again, at this point, um, looking around at the shelves, we might have 65 different products. Um, wow. So a lot of different things, a lot of different areas, but uh, it's all done by a relatively small team. Um, and it's all stuff that we think is really reflective of our region and uh, is stuff we hope that our customers are as excited about as we are. Let's talk about the the name Wiggle. Now, a lot of customers and uh, whiskey fans out there would call it Weigle because mm-hmm. it's only got one G, but it's Wiggle. But you told me that there's a backstory to that, right? Yeah. So uh, really, when we're talking about uh, the historical legacy of whiskey in, in Pennsylvania and in Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, uh, the big event that always, always comes up is going to be the Whiskey Rebellion. And so... Uh, the Whiskey Rebellion took place around Pittsburgh, and one of the uh, rascals, shall we call them, uh, who did not want to pay taxes on uh, his whiskey was a man named Philip Weigel. Uh, he was a an immigrant of German and Scottish uh, dis- heritage. I believe he would have been uh, German. In any case, he would have pronounced it Weigel. And he was one of the conspirators who was uh, sentenced to hang in Philadelphia by George Washington for starting the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, He ended up having his sentence commuted and moved up to Canada to continue making whiskey. Um, But in the local legend and the local history, uh, Philip Weigel was one of the major drivers for the Whiskey Rebellion. And we took on his name, we feel like for uh, at least fun, joy, and marketing, 
uh, wiggle whiskey rather than Weigel whiskey is a little bit, uh, rolls off the tongue a little bit easier, but it, we're named after a, a real guy who, uh, was really angry about taxes <laughs> and <laughs> threw a little bit of a fit about it. Um, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people don't know that George Washington was sent up here to kind of squash the whiskey rebellion. And they sent a guy that was making whiskey himself, but he was paying his taxes, I guess. It's the whole history is, is really fascinating. And particularly in the past three years is, uh, there have been some more relevant, some parts about it that feel more relevant now. Um, but this is the, the first example of, uh, the government really putting federal power forward and, uh, trying to rein in the frontier. And so it was exceptionally important for George Washington to, uh, handle this situation and in the earliest days of the country, not lose the country. Um, but yeah, the result of it is in a couple of years, the largest distillery is uh, Mount Vernon. He did quite well. Um, and a lot of the, the whiskey that was being made in this region, it left. And it, that's a story that isn't really just the whiskey rebellion. It goes into a lot more of agricultural history um, and in a, a longer time frame. But, um, you know, you can certainly say that by prohibition, spirits are not the same contributor to uh, the local economy that they had been for the previous 200, 300 years. Well, we'll get into that and what building you're in and what's right across the street in this area. But you got another whiskey in front of me here, uh, another bourbon. So what do you got for me? So this is a single barrel straight uh, bourbon. And this would uh, technically count as a bottled and bond bourbon if we chose to market it that way. Um, this is a five-year-old expression uh, bottled at 100 proof from a single barrel. I believe it's five years, eight months. And really, I just wanted to, to highlight the difference between you know, our standard blended bourbon that we widely distribute. And we are you know, in this situation where every once in a while we have exceptional single barrels that just on their own scream out to be uh, packaged without adulterating any further. Um, so for both rye and bourbon, uh, we like to do single barrel expressions. It's not something that we can have uh, year round or stock all the time. We're not that big. And frankly, we, we want to save this for the really special occasions, something where the bourbon practically demands it. Like special occasion when the big chief comes and visits. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so is this the same mash bill as your, your regular bourbon? Correct. Um, same mash bill. This is for all intents and purposes, closely, closely related to the blended, uh, bit that we did earlier, but this is a single 53 gallon barrel. And, uh, we typically barrel at around 125 as low as 120 proof. Um, and so we're just taking it down to a hundred and bottling it right there. Now are you using the river water out here? <laughs> Not quite the, uh, the Monongahela water. No, no. Uh, we use, um, reverse osmosis water. Okay. So we've got our nice filter set up over in the back and it filters all the, the weirdness out. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Trust me. I wouldn't want to drink that water either. Beautiful nose on this. Uh, this is a hundred proof. Like you said, um, a little bit more. No alcohol on this though, really to me, um, little less honey on this, a little more spice. I think, I think to me, I do not get the, the same, uh, fruit note right on the front, not quite as sharp on the front, but, um, I still do get that roasted citrus component and that nice, uh, warmth as it's going down. Yeah. Um, 
a little I, more oak with this too, though. Sure. It means five years, would you say eight months? Yep. Um, compared to that, that's what you say that was two years, a little more two years. So with that one, I would expect that uh, the first bourbon we tried had probably two barrels that would have been uh, four years old and maybe uh, four to five 25s that might be two to three years old. Okay. So you got to put that youngest date on the bottle. Yep, exactly. Um, for all our listeners out there. Well, oh, heck, cheers. Let me taste this thing. Man, what a pop rocks on that right there. Mm -hmm. um, as a kid, you get those pop rocks and eat them and it just it just bouncing off the tongue layer after layer those toasted marshmallows are on here that uh roasted citrus it it's all here and stuff a little bit more lemony with this one though mm -hmm. than would it be orange and i don't know maybe that oaks playing with that a little bit i think i think the little higher proof you get a little bit more of the sharpness uh perceived on the palate as well um and it's as you just sort of let it open up on on your tongue it it can go a little bit further i think uh in developing just on its own now i get a little bit less hug with this one than i do the first one um maybe because it has aged out it's taking those rough edges out a little bit picked up some more of those wood sugars mm -hmm. um this one's actually a little less sweet though to me um on my palate so uh, still a beautiful expression so driving in here and stuff we see food companies we see macaroni company we see flour company mm -hmm. everything's pittsburgh by the way <laughs> um but we pull in here and right across the street from you guys this giant old building beautiful it's humongous i don't know four or five stories tall phoenix brewing company and i'm guessing we're in an old brewing district here this is really a food production food manufacturing district so you know the the city of pittsburgh if if you were to pull up uh, google maps or pull up a topographical map it is a city that is very segmented by neighborhood and by geography whether it be rivers or hills uh, so you're really segmented and if you think back to uh 17th 18th 19th centuries when the rivers are really the highways you need to have uh, these spaces accessible by the rivers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, Phoenix Brewing was right here. We are uh, about a block and a half by the rivers. If we were to walk this way, you know, 200 paces, we're going to hit a river. Um, and so all around us, you had importers, manufacturers, uh, really famously or not famously, but very obviously, if you were to come into the neighborhood right now, there's a big development in the fruit terminal building, which, you know, for hundreds of years, all fresh produce uh, and fruits and vegetables would have passed through there to get into the city. And so this is definitely a food centric part of the city, just naturally. Um, the barriers make it more so. And, you know, in the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, there were opportunities with warehouses and space for brewers and distillers to move in. And so we were the first distillery to open up uh, in Pittsburgh since Prohibition, but um, we've got a couple of neighbors, a uh, couple blocks down at this point. We've got uh, Kingfly Spirits, uh, two blocks down, and then uh, Maggie's Rum, which is a fantastic, fantastic uh, rum distillery there, uh, a couple blocks down as well. There's you know, the history of the neighborhood it is still very food centric. Uh, folks from Pittsburgh coming in on Saturday, Sunday morning to pick up all the family groceries for a, a tailgate, a Sunday dinner, um, anything like that. You know, this neighborhood is, is really known for the food scene and it's neat. It's been hundreds of years and it has certainly changed context and uh, maybe the types of food or manufacturing that's happening, but uh, there's been a consistent presence. You said this building used to be part of the Phoenix Brewing Company too, right? Part of the distillery itself. Right. So um, Phoenix Brewing right here owned uh, a massive just area. And 
underneath our building. If you were to go into our basement until four months ago, six months ago, there was a creepy tunnel that went from our building underneath the road here to uh, Phoenix Brewing's building across the street. And that tunnel would have just been used to move uh, product and and uh, raw materials back and forth and not have to get in front of uh, trolleys and uh, horse carts and all that stuff. Um, we have since filled in the tunnel and now use the basement for storage. But uh, I would definitely say that Phoenix Brewing ghosts might be hanging around. Now you were trying to make me record down there. You said it's a creepy basement. <laughs> well, I was really excited for the opportunity of, hey, nice to meet you. Let's go down to the basement. <laughs> I thought that would have been a really fun thing. You're going to take a giant man like me into the basement. I'm not saying you're you're not a very big man. So. <laughs> I, I, I'd feel safer with you being down there with me. I mean, <laughs> I well, don't know. Well, this single barrel straight bourbon right here, uh, I really like it and stuff. Uh, I can't wait to get to the kind of the second half of these other two bottles because you got two bottles laid out in front of me that uh, I'm very, you piqued my interest. Um, but I wanted to take a chance to talk about our sponsor, Seldom Seen Farms. You can go to their website, seldomseenmaple.com. You can pick up some of their, or their bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. It's been aged in bourbon barrels for six to nine months. That's a sucking up that used bourbon right there. Instead of sending those barrels over to Scotland, we've sent them up to Ohio. He's tapping those uh, maple trees, all 2000 of them. He starts that kind of in January, February and March starts dripping that sap out. And then he cooks it down, cooks all the water out and stuff. And what he comes out with is this beautiful maple syrup. Then he ages it in that bourbon barrel. Now, you can use that maple syrup for all kinds of different things from not only putting on your pancakes, your waffles, your biscuit. If you're that kind of a guy like me, have a little bit of sausage, a little bit of maple syrup, make a fat guy happy. <clears throat> but you can also make a beautiful old fashioned with it. You can make a great bourbon glaze with it. All kinds of uses for this maple syrup. So go out there and visit them. Seldom seen maple.com. Pick up a bottle today, gift it to somebody for Christmas. It would make the perfect gift for that bourbon drinker out there. So, Mike, you got another whiskey set in front of me. What's this third one you got for us? So, I thought for the, um, the next two, I wanted to take us into um, sort of the most developed of our whiskeys. And so, this third whiskey is going to be. Uh, it's our port rye. So this is a, uh, a straight rye whiskey that is finished in port barrels. This was a, one of our first barrel finished products where we, uh, move an aged whiskey out of its charred new American oak barrels and finish it in, uh, barrels that have previously held another spirit, a wine, or, uh, even maple syrup. And I love this product because to me, it is a really great encapsulation of two iconic spirits or alcohols. So port, if, if you're not familiar with port wine, uh, port wine is a, uh, it is a fortified wine made in uh, the city of Porto in Portugal. And port wine and the history of Portugal and during the age of discovery, the city of Porto is on the edge of a frontier. All of the uh, trade ships that are going to uh, the new world that are going to um, Southeast Asia, they're stopping and loading up in Porto. They're going to pick up some of this port wine. And in a similar way, Porto is a very industrial city as well. Um, iron, things like this. In a similar way, I think you can see Pittsburgh reflected as this sort of frontier uh, city at the in the 17th, 18th centuries. And the frontier alcohol was Monongahela rye. I think there's a really neat uh, 
sort of synthesis between those stories of industrial towns that are on the edge of a frontier and have these iconic alcohols that they send with the uh, folks who leave from that base. I think the story is really neat, but this is also just a, a huge passion project of mine. I, I love port wine, and I think the qualities of uh, different types of port really, really, really complement rye whiskey. So for example, um, rye can have that, that really distinct bite to it. A yeah. lot of people who don't love rye, they'll tell you it's the spice, it's the bite. It's this barniness I don't care for. Because port wine is, is fortified, it's a little bit sweeter. You're going to get these lovely uh, grape notes and venuous qualities in addition to a completely different mouthfeel. The sugars in that wine that are left over in that barrel, they add weight. And so, you know, this whiskey, the rye would have been um, in this batch about three years old and then gone into port barrels for, uh, in this case, two and a half, three years. And I just love it. I, I think the story is really neat. And I think the way that it uh, came together with complementary flavors that come together as a cohesive experience. I just, I love this stuff. Well, it's dark ruby red in the bottle, right? Different bottle though. Different bottle. We are, uh, we're moving away from this bottle type. Uh, it's a big hefty, uh, sort of rectangular type bottle, uh, that is, is lovely. Kind of a pain in the butt to work with. So are you going to move away from the regular bottle too? We're right now we're in the process of moving everything into the regular bottle. And then we will look to potentially get a custom uh, mold for our highest tier down the line. But uh, supply chain issues, it is so much difficult. It is, it's really hard right now to get any packaging supplies, but uh, to maintain inventory of multiple types of bottles um, is really difficult. And I feel for anybody who... Uh, is distilling and packaging into 10 different bottle types because uh, we've been there, but the past year and a half, we've really been trying to... You had a stockpile. We had a stockpile, but we just want to be in a in a place where we're not going to get pinched by the sort of waves that are going across uh, the supply chain right now. Yeah. A lot of people out there right now, a lot of distilleries are having uh, problems because there is a glass shortage. Uh, there's a lot of bottles sitting in containers right now. Um, probably off the coast of California, more than likely um, all that glass is needed for bourbon, for whiskey. Um, it's a, it's a, so times we live in, uh, they're having to resort to different bottles. And like you said, it's got to be a headache. I know it's a headache because they got to figure out if their label fits on it. Do you go to a printed on label? Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And, you know, this season for us is when, uh, you know, most distilleries uh, expect to make a, a major amount of their uh, sales within a given year. So if you're struggling to to find the materials to make that package that you can sell really, really big repercussions for that. And, uh, you know, the industry, especially at the craft level tends to be really, uh, collaborative. So, uh, you know, we've sent out some of our extra glass to other distilleries to make sure that they can put stuff out. Um, but it, it's one of those things that maybe doesn't filter through to uh, customers. But if you talk to any producers, uh, they're feeling the the strain and we're not. Oh, yeah. We really kind of went off on a supply tangent there. <laughs> Let's get back to this uh, port rye. Now, I, don't, I haven't seen a whole bunch of port ryes out there. You know, that everybody would think that the one that comes to mind would be Angel's Envy, the big boy on the block, right? The, the Henderson's kind of, uh, I wouldn't say cornered the market on it, but they started the revolution with these. Um, I'm excited to taste this one. The nose on this, it, it's very, very powerful nose. Um, I do get the port wine in there. I get a lot of that honey coming back from that first bourbon. Um, that sugar smackums kind of cereal smell. You know, when you open up that cereal box as a little kid, and you're like, mm, this is going to taste real good with my Saturday morning cartoons. For sure. There's, 
I think there's an element, you know, there's that almost uh, elemental like Welch's grape jelly. You get just this little note of that um, hanging in there. What's interesting about how we approach this is I would say that our expectations for how we would make this, my expectations specifically, practically the opposite. And so we got uh, a bunch of two different profiles of port barrels. We got Ruby port and Tawny port. Now, Ruby port is most typically going to be uh, the brighter, fresher, uh, sweeter flavors. And this is a huge generalization, but Tawny is going to get into more whiskey type, type of stuff. You're going to see notes of tobacco and leather and, and those qualities. And we expected that we would be emptying the ruby barrels first and then the tawny barrels will need more time, but we'll do those next. And it ended up being that a blend is the way that we've got to do it. And so we do uh, two tawny barrels to every ruby barrel. It's a two to one ratio. We typically uh, harvest three barrels at a time for this. And it's again, you're trying to, to hone in on a specific experience that's consistent where you get these higher sort of grape jelly characters, but then you want it to taste like an aged whiskey. And, you know, those other qualities should come through. It shouldn't taste like a, a sugar bomb or, you know, this overly sweet, um, type of product. Well, heck, let me taste this thing. Man, that is good right there. I like it. It is mouth coating. Like you said, it's uh, oily, creamy is a word to use, I guess. Um, that that port has come through beautiful, but it's still leaving that taste for the whiskey. This right here is what I call that um, introduction whiskey to opening the door, opening somebody up to drinking whiskey right here. If they didn't like bourbon, they didn't like scotch, this right here would be a right up their alley. I think, I think the fortified wine barrels and, and the barrel finishing can often be a, a really great place to, um, to bring people into the whiskey fold. So, uh, we do barrel finishes with, uh, with wine barrels, um, barrel finishes with beer barrels. And that's another one where, you know, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of people who love craft beer, but maybe a little bit apprehensive about the spirit side. And, you know, if I can give somebody a, a whiskey, tell them this was aged in, uh, Great Lakes Christmas ale barrels. And all of a sudden they're saying, that's, that's my beer. I get two cases of that every year. I try to make them last. Let me try that. Um, so I, I do think the barrel finished, uh, sort of category and structure is, a it's just a great way to expand, uh, to new offerings, new flavor types. Uh, but also for consumers, it's a great way to be introduced to both sides of things, whiskey side or the, whatever the other finished barrel might be. Yeah. That, that gateway whiskey for people, um, whiskey nerds like me need to know that all straight whiskey, uh, isn't always the best, you know, and the more people that drink whiskey, uh, is better for the industry, right? It makes growth possible. It makes more people buy stuff off the shelf. Once they start drinking that, they'll be like, Oh, maybe I could try this straight bourbon whiskey. Maybe I could try this cast strength, um, and get that, the goodness out of it. But sometimes that can be way too much for somebody. Um, and something like this will open those doors up. Yeah, I think, I think finding opportunities where you can um, make something that resonates with with the whiskey fans, um, but also can be a draw to somebody who has never thought of themselves of being a, a whiskey fan or a whiskey person. We want to invite more folks to the party always. Um, and so I think it's, 
important to just build opportunities for that and um never look to make anything that is uh you know specifically for one little group um we really want to bring in more people to the party and make stuff that our customers are excited to drink be them um people who know everything about whiskey or again people who have never in their life thought i'm a whiskey person well the the whiskey enthusiasts out there really um when we we're talking about guys that just straight up like whiskey they have whiskey collections they're really into whiskey not that guy or gal that's drinking and is like putting on that face but the people that really love whiskey like me and jim um we're only one percent a whiskey company a distillery doesn't want to sell to one percent they want to sell to 99 percent which is a smart idea right in business and i think it's you know like all things it's about balance you don't want to put yourself in a position where you know you are uh just making whatever gets the highest ranks on a survey or just copying what uh, the number one bourbon of 2021 in such and such magazine. But you do need to, I think, uh, have your ears open and have a a perspective that you're willing to, to change direction or meet people halfway. Um, for any business, you've got to, you've got to be flexible. Um, and, we never, never, never want to um, make concessions on quality or process, uh, but we also know that we're not the smartest folks in in the building, and we need customers to meet us somewhere. We can't keep making, uh, you know, strange eau de pickle or saffron amaro if we aren't selling bourbon and cinnamon whiskey and. Uh, coffee liqueur it really needs to be a, a holistic uh, view of a portfolio and also of your customer base i think it, it's natural and it it can be a little bit difficult uh when you have you know some customers seem to be very 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 uh passionate and very loud and others seem maybe more uh not apathetic, but less engaged. I think it's just this idea that you really do need to work and put in work to make sure you're uh, hearing everything and uh, meeting customer demands and uh, meeting your own internal goals. Sure. So I'm sitting here. We're actually inside your distillery. It's working. You got your whole crew back there, your teams back there. They're grinding grain. They're there's some in there running in the steel right now. I saw it. I was like, oh, man, I could smell it when I walked in the door. What what are the steels back there? So we have two uh, alambic copper pot stills, uh, one of which is uh, has a column and a gin basket set up. Uh, that still's full capacity is about 1,500 liters. Uh, and our other still, uh, which is just a big, big copper pot still, uh, as a capacity around uh, maybe 2000 liters, something like that. Um, so all of our work is just on these two German copper stills. Um, and again, we make everything through there from the aged whiskeys, which, you know, most typically we do like a stripping run with, the uh, um, unfiltered mash and then a final distillation. Um, and we'll redistill the heads and tails. Um, we do column distillations to make super high proof brandies or, uh, wheat whiskeys that might be used for liqueurs. Um, and then, yeah, gin, the gin basket gets worked pretty much every week now. So how many barrels are you guys putting out a year right now? Um, so generally we do about, uh, 25,000 proof gallons per year. And um, we're doing six mashes per week. Each mash is about 105 to 110 proof gallons. 
Um, so a direct barrels, I, I don't have that number off the top of my head. The other interesting thing about it is just what percentage of what we make goes into storage versus what is just used right away. Um, and at this point, most months about, uh, 80, 85% of what we make is, uh, going into a storage account into barrels, uh, and then the rest will be new make for processing right away. And you do not run out of room too. Um, so you got a couple of warehouses with whiskey that's aging right now. Yeah. We, again, uh, the story of our distillery could really easily be illustrated just by uh, square footage that uh, we take up now. So whereas when Wiggle first opened up, all of the aging was done here on site. Uh, we now have uh two very, very, very large, uh, warehouses. We just purchased a second one. And, uh, you know, I suspect based on previous experience that it will not seem like a long time at all when we're looking for another, uh, facility barrels, especially when you're looking to grow the age statement, they just take up space. Yeah. I mean, you gotta have somewhere to put them all right. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they, uh, I was calling it the liquid assets, right? Um, you gotta have a large area to put barrels, stack them up and, uh, or rick them. Um, which is cool to me, you know, one of the, the neat parts of, about our experience as it relates to the warehouses is, you know, the transition from where one warehouse to the other had huge impacts on, on the aging. Uh, we had one facility that was relatively temperature controlled, meaning uh, it would kick on a heater and maintain at uh, 48 or 50 degrees all year round. Uh, and the facility that ages most of our barrels now has absolutely no heat control. So it's probably going to take a little bit longer for those barrels to age out because in wintertime here in Pittsburgh, as we know, it gets cold here, right? It gets cold. It also, I mean, you have the opposite where the summer does get that hot where uh, we haven't seen a consistency with we need longer. We've seen a lot of a lot of variables with um, proof where the proofs used to in our old place tend to go up a little bit. We would put something in a barrel at 123 to four years later, it's 123.5, 124. Uh, and with, you know, the other facility that is not climate controlled, our experience is most typically we are uh, losing proof points. So we'll go from 120 and come out at 117. And, you know, there are days where I remember when we first opened that facility, it was one of these days where uh, it got really warm for a day where after it had been very cold for four weeks and we went into the barrel house and it looked like somebody had sprayed a fire hose on all of the barrels uh to the point that they're all just they look wet and the vertical barrels had uh a full head of water on the top and that's just to say that the conditions were such that the water was pushed out of the barrel, the alcohol stayed in. Sure. Um, and so, you know, being a, a small distillery and working with uh, different barrel sizes, different barreling facilities, different farms, different lots, uh, our blender tailor is really, really doing an incredible job of blending to consistency when the name of the game is variability, it's always dealing with different variables. And, um, again, it's a, it's a neat challenge and we've got a hell of a guy doing it. Um, but you know, you think forward and we anticipate we're always going to have to some extent these variables, uh, at play. Sure. Well, speaking of variables, speaking of something different, our last whiskey you got for me is something definitely different. What do you got for me? So this is uh, one of our most um, famous products, and it is uh, called American Rye Kilted Cask. 
If you are a Wiggle fan, you might know it from its previous name, Kilted Rye. Uh, this is a super duper terroir driven uh, whiskey. And so we wanted to, to look to have products or have a product that really spoke to uh, scotch drinkers. Um, and we had done some different varieties of neat malts and those were released with, you know, varying levels of success. But then we thought about how could we make a whiskey that resonates with scotch people, but doesn't compete with scotch. We're never going to be able to compete with scotch. You know, you can get at, uh, some stores, an 18 year old, a 20 year old, a 15 year old single malt for a, a really attractive price that quite frankly, we can't compete with. And so we were looking for our own expression that was uh, definitively our own, that was unique, but would be recognizable to, to Scotch folks. So this is a malted rye whiskey. It's 95% malted rye, 5% uh, malted barley, organic for both. Uh, this is a collaboration with Valley Malt, which is a malt house in Amherst, Massachusetts. Super duper neat family company, really, 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 really small scale. One of the only organic malt houses uh, in the country. And they use our local, locally grown organic rye. They malt it. Uh, we do a mash bill with it. We start this whiskey aging in uh, new and used cooperage. And then we transfer into Lafroy casks for at least a year of finishing. Now, for our listeners, what's a Lafroy cask? So Lafroy is uh, one of the iconic uh, brands distilleries in Scotland. It is a, a Scotch distillery, and uh, Lafroy is known for having a peaty Scotch. And in Scotch production, you're mostly talking about uh, malted barley as the base grain. And the use of peat moss and peat smoking to dry the grain, it's a traditional part of uh, that process going back 400 years. It is a resource that is widely available there. Uh, it has a very, very distinct character to it uh, when you're using peat smoke. And so uh, if you have friends who are Lafroy drinkers, if you've ever experienced Lafroy, uh, campfire or just general smoke is a really prominent. Uh, feature there. And so when we get these empty casks from Lafroy, they've got this really smoky quality to them. And we're going to lay down our malted rye whiskey on top of that and soak it up over the course of a year. So this ends up being a totally unique expression from, you know, Pennsylvania grain, uh, malted in Massachusetts, but it's not something that a, a scotch drinker necessarily would ever be able to get in Scotland. Uh, it is a, a uniquely sort of in the middle expression. Um, it's also the source of a fair bit of uh, extra legal work because the Scotch Whiskey Association was terribly upset uh, at us for using a sort of check pattern and then the name Kilted Rye. So this bottle that we're pouring from is actually the brand new uh, bottle, brand new name. Uh, we have been in lawyerly negotiations with the Scotch Whiskey Association for about a year and a half now. But it says American Rye Kilted Cask to me, you know, as long as you say American. <laughs> it, I mean... I can absolutely understand uh, the Scotch Whiskey Association uh, being protective of of their brand. Uh, there are moments when you're arguing about patterns where it feels like kind of a surreal uh, kind of thing. Sure. Well, heck, let's nose this thing real fast. Definitely has that smokiness to it. Um, campfire, I don't know, maybe more of a wood fire in your house kind of that uh like a wood stove smoke 
kind of a cleaner wood, I guess, than you would have at a campfire. Because you can throw anything on a campfire, but in wood stove and a fireplace in your house, you want to make sure you're burning some kind of hardwood, right? Very beautiful. That orange citrus is in this, though. Or Orange citrus might, might just be our calling card. <laughs> Today, that's what I'm getting at of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's certainly one where the nose is going to hint at it. The palate's going to hit you over the head with it. Well, let's taste this. Cheers. Cheers. Not as peaty. It's more nutty. Mm-hmm. Like a... Uh, toasted almonds a little bit smoked toasted almonds Mm -hmm. that citrus is there but more of that smoked toasted almonds that smokiness of those i like it that's definitely different i think it would if you were differing between bourbon and scotch this might meet you right in the middle and you could get there and you know going back to the discussion we were on maybe 10 minutes ago I have sold this to to folks and described it in the past as a reasonable gateway drug to to the PD scotches. If you've had, you know, an old Laphroaig or one of the really, really classic PD scotches and thought that's way intense, this is going to maybe meet you halfway. This has got that honey sweetness to it, though, you know, um, maybe a little bit of orange marmalade to it i would say not so much of that smokiness is overpowering to people that peatiness i'll tell you what when i'm breathing out with this i and this is going to be terrible uh this is not the most floral language um or attractive language but when i'm breathing out on this i get a little bit of a quality of like a a tire fire a tire fire. <laughs> hey you guys <laughs> said it. i didn't say that uh i don't get that at all um, I just get that toasted, like, you know, toasted marshmallow is that one note, I guess everybody would say, but this is more of that toasted honey nut, nut Cheerios, maybe something like that. Um, I think it's great. Um, I think you guys did an outstanding job with that. Introducing something that's definitely different. Um, kind of, you said that gateway whiskey for people that or halfway in between somebody that likes that sweetness of bourbon, but somebody that also likes that peatiness, smokiness of a scotch. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the movement in America, there's a, a big movement for single malt yeah, and making that into a meaningful category. And to me, I, I certainly love making malt whiskeys. I like drinking them. I think I also really appreciate that we have a lot of different categories and a lot of different, we have a lot of freedom to make different expressions. And so, you know, to a consumer who, you know, loves Scotch whiskey and they've known they've always loved Scotch whiskey, American craft uh, right now, we we can't compete with age statement. We can't compete with price. Those well, you are really don't have to when it becomes scotch or even bourbon, right? Because it, it, to me, each whiskey has its own place in in the world. Um, whereas scotch will take eighteen years, bourbon in Kentucky takes eight to twelve years. Mm-hmm. Um, bourbon whiskey or whiskey in Texas it takes about thirty two months. Can you do what Texas is doing? No. Can you do what Scotland's doing? No. But you're doing what Pennsylvania, what Pittsburgh can do. I think that's always, I mean, that's just generally the the healthy perspective is, you know, you focus on what you can do well. Always look for for ways to improve, learn new things. Um, But if you're too focused on what's happening around you or looking to uh, directly compete with something that, you know, is iconic and 400 years old, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the the best way to go about it. Sure. Well, Michael, I got to say thank you for letting this come into Wiggle Whiskey today, um, giving us a, a tour of your distillery. 
um, showing us all your your staff here, talking, let me talk to them, taking photos, and um, kind of geeking out in here like like a good whiskey geek. It's a absolute pleasure and uh, privilege. This is fun to show off. So uh, let's give you a chance. Where can our listeners find you guys on social media? Uh, we're definitely most active on Instagram and Facebook and uh, Wiggle Whiskey. Uh, if you type that in, you will find us uh, right away. Yeah, I think for social, that's, I believe our our top is just uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram. I don't and think we're TikToking yet. You're not TikToking yet. Where can our listeners buy your products? Which states are you guys in? So th- this is uh, a little bit tricky. We are in a number of states. We're mostly focused uh, mid Atlantic, uh, Northeast. So right now we are in uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Georgia, Tennessee, and Illinois. Um. And certainly have plans to to grow, continue getting into uh, more states. But uh, we're also in that sweet spot where um, we are managing our aged whiskey stocks. And so we cannot grow unsustainably. We are growing in line with our aged whiskey. Um, so it can definitely be we are not we are not the most widely distributed craft distillery. Um, you go to wigglewhiskey.com. We definitely do a lot of online business as well. Um, I would highly recommend to folks who might know Wiggle Whiskey, might see us uh, in store, on a shelf, in a magazine. If you have the opportunity to visit us in Pittsburgh, uh, you will see all 85 of our product line in distribution, it's a really small portion of our product line that really gets widely distributed. It'll be a straight bourbon, straight rye, gin, um, and a couple of other uh, whiskeys and expressions. But uh, to anybody who has the opportunity to to visit Pittsburgh, uh, if you have time and come to the distillery, you will be able to taste, uh, learn about, and uh, really see a pretty huge portfolio of uh classic expressions as well as uh really off the wall and innovative type things you guys also have a uh restaurant or kitchen here too so yeah. somebody can come in eat drink be happy 100 percent. i'll tell you what the uh best thing that folks are doing these days is uh pittsburgh is a Steelers town so on Steelers Sunday, we'll be getting uh, folks come to the distillery, uh, get a nice big breakfast, have a few cocktails, and uh, you know really make that day into the best day. Um, but uh, food and restaurant is open. I think every day now we have expanded hours because we're in our holidays, um, and we also have a cider house on the other side of the river that has a. Uh, a pizza oven, pizza restaurant. So Threadbare Cider, uh, if you are a cider drinker or curious about uh, you know, ciders and wines made in Pennsylvania, we have a whole lot of mead, cider, uh, stuff like that as well. Well, listeners out there, if you're flying into Pittsburgh for business, for just coming up here to watch a game, watching the uh, Pirates play, um, watching the Penguins play, watching the Steelers play. I, I can't believe I just said that <laughs> because I'm a Cowboys fan. But um, if you're coming up here to watch some games, coming up here for business, make sure you come into Wiggle Whiskey, support this craft distillery. Come see Michael. Uh, you'll see him wearing a green Carhartt hat around. Um, come pay him a visit support small distilleries they need your love um uh michael once again we really do appreciate it and i i just add uh support local farmers we are part of the agricultural system we really 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 care about the folks around us what they're growing what they're doing and um we love these products we like we love presenting them to folks, having folks uh, try them and enjoy them. But we are also um, really invested in our community. And so, um, you know, supporting Wiggle Whiskey is supporting 
family owned farms, uh, and a whole lot of other vendors. Well, we say amen to that, to the American farmer out there. Uh, we tip a hat to you. We say cheers. Well, you can find us on social media. We are on TikTok. We're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We're all over the place. You know, the best place to find us is we have a private Facebook group called the Bourbon Roadies, 2,500 people strong. You got to do th- three things to join. Uh, are you 21? Do you like bourbon? Hell yes. Everybody likes bourbon. And do you agree to play nice because we don't tolerate any rudeness in there? Um, that's just saying we like to celebrate life in there. If you want to drink from the bottom of the shelf, you want to drink a craft whiskey like Wig Whiskey, which I was drinking today. Or if you want to drink from the very top of that shelf, let's say a bottle of Pappy, if you could even find it. Um, we want you to do that. But we want you to celebrate births, retirements, uh, birthdays. Even somebody's death, the celebration of life, we want you to do that. We'll raise a glass to to that family member, that loved one, <clears throat> and say cheers. Um, we also have our website. You can buy our swag in there. We have a T-shirt we want everybody to wear. It's the Bourbon Bullshitter T-shirt. You know what it is. We also have our Bourbon Road swag in there, um, our regular T-shirt, our hats, our whiskey glass, decanters, um, you name it, we got it in there. So come in there, shop in there. We'd appreciate your support. That's what gets us down the Bourbon Road. I also write articles in there once a week. Uh, go in there and check that article in there. You can also leave us comments in there if you want to. We'd really appreciate if you leave us a comment. If you want us to go to a distillery, if you want us to talk about something in whiskey, we're always open to suggestions. Um, we would really appreciate that as well. So we do two shows a week. We do our uh, long episode like today with Michael and Wiggle Whiskey. We also do a bourbon review. You'll probably see a Wiggle Whiskey on one of those shows shortly. Um, check those out. So the way to remember and find out we got a show coming up is we want you to scroll on up top of that app, hit that check sign, that plus sign, that s- subscribe button, whatever you got to hit to make sure you says your phone's going to say, hey, these cho- two jokers got an episode coming out. Um, then we want you to scroll on down, hit that five star review because you know what's going to happen if you don't. I'm going to come over to your house. I'm going to bring a whole bunch of this wiggle whiskey. I'm going to bring my big friend, the big bad booty daddy of bourbon, is going to come over with me. We're going to drink all this wiggle whiskey. By the end of the night, I'm going to get a five star review out of you. I guarantee. So uh, let's get that. That five star review seriously opens doors to wiggle whiskey for us it opens it up to other distilleries gets us great guests on great conversation great content for you to listen to back and forth to work um we love that you can always reach out to us at our emails jim at the bourbon road mike at the bourbon road but probably the best way the best way to reach out to us is on our private instagram accounts the bourbon road jim is jay shannon 63 i'm one big chief And we'll see you on down the bourbon road.